Welcome. My name is Scott Malone. I'm an editor with Reuters in Boston, and I'll be your moderator today. Today's program is an hour long, and it's a collaboration of the Forum at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and Reuters. This event has also been organized with the Center for Global Tobacco Control and the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the Harvard Chan School. The debate around the role of e-cigarettes and their regulation has roiled the public health community. We'll review why e-cigarettes and other electronic nicotine delivery systems, or ENDSs, products are controversial. Then we'll take a look at some policy questions related to their regulation. <clears throat> we'll take questions from the online audience as well as you here in the studio. Questions for the panelists, for those of you online, can be emailed to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu or tweeted to at forum hsph using the hashtag, hashtag eSigsForum. You can also participate in the live chat discussion that's happening online at the forum site right now. Today's panelists, starting from my immediate right, are Vaughn Rees, lecturer on social and behavioral sciences in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences and interim director of the Center of Global T Tobacco Control at the Harvard Chan School. Then we have Howard Koh, professor of the practice of public health leadership at the Harvard Chan School and former assistant secretary for, of health for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And K. Vish Vishnawatha, Professor of Health Communication in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the Harvard Chan School and in the McGraw-Patterson Center for Population Sciences at the Danaher Farber Cancer Institute. In addition, joining us remotely, we have Kenneth Warner, Distinguished University Professor of Public Health and former Dean of the University of Michigan School of Public Health, and David Hammond, Associate Professor at the University of Waterloo School of Public Health and Health Systems, and former advisor to the World Health Organization for the Framework Convention on Tobacco C Control. With that, I'd like to, to uh, kick the conversation off and turn it over to you, Vaughn. Thanks very much, Scott. Um, well, we're, we're witnessing an event with enormous implications for public health with the um, advent of, of a new and very aggressive e-cigarette industry that's quickly achieved a $3 billion market share, having, having uh, reached that level from virtually nothing uh, six or seven years ago. On the one hand, we've seen tobacco control efforts in the United States and indeed globally have had um, an enormous impact. We've seen the prevalence of smoking in the US decline by about half um, in the past 50 years, thanks to efforts that have helped to restrict um, advertising and marketing that have um, resulted in better health communication, um, including tobacco product warning labels. We've seen restrictions on age access, um, mostly restricting access to youth aged um, under 18. Um, we've seen very effective implications of price control through excise taxes. Um, and recently the FDA have gained regulatory authority over tobacco products, um, which has far reaching implications on how those tobacco products might be regulated to, um, to enhance or to protect the public health. But meanwhile, e-cigarettes, or, or ENDS as Scott, Scott suggested, um, have recently become quite ubiquitous. And e-cigarettes offer an opportunity to reduce the harm associated with tobacco use because they don't involve combustion of tobacco. Instead, they deliver nicotine, um, which is suspended in a propylene glycol or glycerin reservoir, which is heated and volatilized and then made available to the consumer through, through puffing the vapor. Um, E-cigarettes may provide an enormous opportunity for the public health community to reduce the harm associated with tobacco use based on the notion that, we, that, if, that if smokers of conventional cigarettes switch 
from um, a tobacco cigarette to an e-cigarette, they may reduce <coughs> the harm associated with the use of that product. On the other hand, though, we're concerned in the tobacco control community that the advent of e-cigarettes being largely unregulated may undermine many of the gains we've made around reducing the prevalence of tobacco use over the past 50 years. E-cigarettes currently are using strategies that um, have not been used with uh, tobacco products for many years, including use of TV and radio to advertise. Uh, there are poor, if any, um, restrictions on youth access. Um, products are being marketed, targeted to youth, making health claims, which have not so far been supported. Um, as well as claims around cessation. We've also seen proliferation of candy flavoured or exotic flavoured cigarettes, including flavours such as bubblegum and um, gummy bear, which are very appealing to youth. So we're concerned about the potential for youth to um, embrace, um, a new generation of youth to embrace tobacco products through the use of e-cigarettes and, and, um, and so undermine gains that we've made in tobacco control. Okay, so I think we see an element of controversy there for sure. And with that, Ken, we'd like to turn it over to you. Could you speak a little bit about uh, how the public health community's uh, view, view of these issues? The public health community, specifically the tobacco control community, unlike any that I've seen in my 40 years in, in this field. Uh, the only possible exception to that was the argument over the master settlement agreement in the 1990s. I think Vaughn characterized it very nicely. We really have two uh, camps on opposite ends of the spectrum. On the one side are the more traditional forces of public health. Uh, these are the folks who are focusing on the concerns about e-cigarettes and electronic nicotine delivery systems. They're worried about those. Uh, they're also focused laser-like on the effects on kids. And uh, they don't seem to be thinking very much about the potential benefits for adult smokers. On the other side of the spectrum are the folks we refer to as uh, the harm reductionists. Uh, these are the people who are looking at smokers who have not quit uh, seem either unable or unwilling to quit to give up their nicotine. Uh, the nicotine replacement products haven't worked for them. And the thought in this camp is that products like e-cigarettes may constitute viable alternatives for these folks. We know that these alternative products, when compared to the dangers of combustible tobacco products, are dramatically less dangerous. There's just no question about that. Uh, that's not to say that they're all only the same. Some of them are, are exposing people to toxic substances that are not in others. Um, what I think is missing here is a strong middle ground. Uh, the issues surrounding kids and worrying about the effects on kids are important, and we have to pay attention to that. But I think a lot of people among what I've referred to as the more traditional public health community are focusing almost exclusively on that. And we don't know a whole lot about the implications of kids' use of e-cigarettes. We do know the vast majority of e-cigarette use is among people who are either smokers or were smokers. I'm talking about kids here. Very few, a very tiny proportion of never smokers uh, have used e-cigarettes in the last 30 days. And uh, the, you know, on the other side of it, we've got these folks who think that uh, this is sort of the, the solution to all of our problems, and it's not that either. The harm reduction camp uh, is missing, the, and they ignore the risks to kids. So it's, it's, it's been a very frustrating, it's been a very vitriolic conversation. So certainly there's, a, there's an element of tension there for sure. Uh, and with that, I think we'll bring it around to you, Howard, and can you talk a little bit about uh, some of the challenges we're seeing at the state and federal level for regulating e-cigarettes? Sure, it's uh, very important to put this forum into proper context. So just to remind this audience, in 2009, the FDA gained unprecedented authority to regulate tobacco for the first time. But that authority applies only to cigarettes, <coughs> smokeless tobacco, and roll your own tobacco. So left completely unregulated are products like e-cigarettes, dissolvables, cigars, and hookahs, for example. And so in that space, Currently, we have absolutely no standards and no regulations for e-cigarettes with respect to dimensions like production, design, manufacturing, quality, safety, and very importantly, advertising and marketing. Now, just exactly a year ago, April 2014, the FDA put out proposed 
rules to extend their authority over those other forms of tobacco, including e-cigarettes, and that's called the deeming process. Uh, there's been a comment period for deeming, and we're hoping the FDA will come out with its final rule very, very soon. Those proposed rules put forward provisions such as prohibiting sales to minors, requiring warning labels, uh, preventing free sample giveaways, uh, themes like that, but very importantly did not address the advertising and marketing dimensions. Uh, we are being told that that will require yet another FDA rulemaking process. So in this void, states and municipalities have stepped up. Uh, we now know that over 40 states ban e-cigarette sales to minors, but only about three states prohibit e-cigarette use in public places as part of upholding clean indoor uh, air. So you have a very active discussion ongoing right now. We're waiting for final rules from the FDA to come forward. But in the interim, we know that e-cigarettes are very much a double-edged sword. In the long run, they could be a very powerful form of harm reduction if proven to be effective through good studies. But in the short term, we have tremendous concern about uptake by non-smokers, by pregnant women, by kids especially, and the proliferation of flavored cigarettes in particular uh, is something that is of great concern to everyone. Okay, and uh, certainly the, the the use by new smokers raises the question of marketing and the company's outreach to them. Uh, and certainly one area under discussion now is the role of regulation in marketing e-cigarettes. Uh, with that, let's take a look at a few advertisements for e-cigarettes. For us smokers, times have changed. But a few things remain the same. Our desire to explore. To adventure. To roam without boundaries. With blue, we can still be ourselves. After all, this country was founded on free will. Embrace it. Chase it. Blue e-cigs. Take back your freedom. your mother's cigarette. Slim, sleek, sparkling, break free from the pack. It's smoke-free, odor-free, and stigma-free. Coordinating colors straight off the runway. Eye-catching accessories. Flavors you can't resist. Your life, your style. It's not smoke, it's Vapor Couture. The new electronic cigarette created just for you. 
Obviously, that's just a sample. We found these videos on the YouTube side of, San of Stanford Research into the impact of tobacco advertising, and they have collections of additional ads if you're interested in watching more. Um, if you're interested in hearing about more, uh, we'll hear about, about them a little bit more from Vish right now. Sure. Thank you, Scott. Uh, so, you no, know, I, I think these ads speak for themselves. Uh, so, my concern is this kind of a public information environment that is engendered by this kind of advertising and the debate and the controversy that is surrounding e-cigarettes. I just want to take you back about 60 years ago when a, a unholy nexus between Hollywood, television industry, and advertising industry tried to exactly try these tactics in normalizing cigarettes, you know, and actually promoting glamour associated with cigarette smoking. Joan Crawford, you know, John Wayne, you know, Jimmy Dean, you know, all these famous actors and actresses were involved in smoking and promoting cigarettes. In fact, one very famous actor went so far as to say that he will send Chesterfield cigarettes to all his friends as a Christmas gift. That is President Ronald Reagan, right? <laughs> so if you go, so if you come fast forward to 70 years now, you will see the same tactics used, being used by the e-cigarettes that were used by big tobacco. Sex, celebrity, glamour, adventure, classic American individualist ethos. These are the same appeals that are being used to advance this idea that somehow smoking e-cigarettes can solve a lot of problems, life's problems, right? You know, so, so our concern is, you know, so what, you know, this notion of promoting cigarettes could potentially lead to two kinds of outcomes, uh, which is one is you know, normalization of smoking, and two, that it could potentially lead to a gateway effect, that it, it could serve as a gateway. Right now, we don't have evidence for either one of those hypotheses, but it could potentially happen. And, and I also want to say that the other thing we are concerned about is this, uh, Dean Warner referred to the debate that is taking place between two camps in the public health community. Some of us are in the middle being hit by the both camps. And, and for in, you know, there are potentially three kinds of effect that could occur as a result of this kind of a debate. One is contradiction and confusion and ambiguity among people who are listening to this debate and who start thinking the scientists can never make up their mind, right? Mm -hmm. And if they start thinking that scientists can never make up their mind, there could potentially be backlash effects. And so why should I believe them and follow them when they cannot make up their mind, right? And that could potentially have some kind of a carryover effect, as Dr. Nagler and others have shown in the context of nutrition. People may not actually resort to more desirable risk behaviors or are, are, uh, are, are not indulge in risky behaviors because you know they have this backlash effects. You know, so there is a danger that this could potentially have negative effects as a result of this debate and controversy that is taking place in the scientific community. I think it's very critical for us as scientists to come together to understand the implications of this debate, the implications of these products, particularly the implications of the marketing of these products. I can, I can end by saying the marketing, as you clearly saw, is not just directed towards smokers, but it is definitely going to appeal, you know, based on the evidence with other products and other uh, 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 issues, it will appeal to a wide range of people, making it more acceptable, I think. Great. And in addition to that, I think one thing that we're seeing is this is a, a trend, an issue that's playing out both here in the United States and, and abroad, really. And with that, we'd like to bring the conversation around to you, David, to uh, provide us with a little bit of international context. <coughs> Thanks, Scott. Well, it's certainly true that countries around the world are experiencing the same regulatory challenges and the same debate that you heard Ken describe. Proponents position e-cigarettes as a life-saving alternative for smokers. Opponents suggest that it's going to increase smoking by recruiting new people into the market. And of course, we have evidence to support both arguments. And I would suggest that ultimately, whether these products have any public health benefit or harm will be dictated by how they're regulated. And right now, we have different countries that provide very different regulatory models. So for the time being, the United States is among the least regulated models. Um, in Canada, for example, no nicotine e-cigarettes have been approved for sale. So technically speaking, e-cigarettes with nicotine are legal for sale in Canada. Now, we still have somewhere around 2.5 million Canadians that have tried these products, and that's not terribly well enforced. 
But in the middle, you have something like the European Union, where they uh, e-cigarettes are widely available for sale, but they've decided to regulate them like tobacco products. So there are comprehensive bans on how they're advertised and marketing, they're taxed, and there's some level of product standards. And the EU model also provides some flexibility for member states. So we see that the United Kingdom, for example, has developed a regulatory framework to license e-cigarettes and other nicotine products as medicines. And they actually uh, approved their first product. Interestingly, it's a product developed by a British American tobacco subsidiary. But the UK model is very much based on harm reduction and the principle that the extent of the regulations should be proportional to the extent of harm for the product. And what's also interesting in the UK is at the same time as they've licensed the product as a medicine, they've also increased their uh, regulation of conventional products in different ways. So uh, internationally, I think some of the key questions or evidence gaps that regulators are confronting, um, I would suggest that the first one is to really identify the best type of regulation for minimizing excess risks. We know that these products are harmful. We also know that they're significantly less harmful than conventional cigarettes. Um, but they vary in terms of what goes in and what comes out of these products. So how can you regulate to minimize any avoidable risk? Um, and I think regulators are really asking where product design is going. So these products are evolving very rapidly. And as their ability to deliver nicotine improves, they'll become more appealing, not just as a quid aid for smoker, but also potentially for uptake. So we see lots of trying among kids, not a lot of regular use. Well, how will that change if the product design changes? So, and I'll finish off by just reinforcing what I think is the importance of international collaboration. We have a series of natural experiments playing out across the world in very different regulatory markets. And this is an opportunity for countries to learn from each other. Um, and I would suggest that this has been fundamentally important in terms of tobacco control policies for conventional products and cigarettes. And I would suggest it's also going to be very important in terms of developing effective uh, regulation of ends and e-cigarettes. So a lot, of, a lot of questions about regulation, a lot of, a lot of different approaches. Uh, we've also seen one rather surprising thing develop here in the United States on the regulatory front, and that's been that uh, the nation's largest tobacco companies have actually come out in favor of regulating e-cigarettes. And that uh, we have a little bit of a video that we'd like to show you on. Big tobacco companies have been advocating for strict rules on e-cigarettes, which they say will give quality and safety standards. But independent companies say that will make it more difficult for them to compete and seal the dominance of big tobacco. This is Martine Geller, consumer goods specialist correspondent for Reuters in London. One of the most uh, dramatic examples of a uh, big tobacco company pushing for regulations is in the United States with uh, Reynolds American asking the FDA to ban uh, what are called open systems or refillable e-cigarettes. If not banning them, then at least having independent vape shops be regulated as manufacturers. Independent companies see that as a, a swipe to them because complying with FDA regulations will likely be much more onerous for a small company than for a big company like Reynolds American. So that um, obviously this, this plays up the, uh, the global discussion on, on tobacco control, tobacco usage. Uh, Howard, how would you, uh, how'd you like to, to tie that in? Well, I think one very positive outcome from this controversy about e-cigarettes is it has brought renewed attention back to the issue of tobacco control as the leading preventable public health challenge of our time. Unfortunately, right now, there's a misperception in the public that somehow the tobacco problem has been solved, particularly in the United States, and it's time to move on to something else. And nothing could be further from the truth. There's no other condition that kills over a half a million Americans every year. There's no other condition that is projected to kill one billion people worldwide in the 21st century. And so this discussion should be viewed as part of that broader discussion about how do we move tobacco control forward and end this epidemic once and for all. Now, uh, with respect to uh, e-cigarettes, the advertising and marketing themes that Vish uh, put forward are very, very uh, disconcerting. And we should make sure that everybody knows that Big Tobacco has jumped in with both feet here in the United States on the e-cigarette theme. The, the major American tobacco companies, Altria, 
Philip Morris, Reynolds American, and Lorillard all now have their e-cigarette products. Uh, they see this as part of their future. They're reinventing themselves in this way. And by using the advertising that you have seen and witnessed even today, uh, they are using themes that were successful for them before, applying it to the e-cigarette market, and in that way, literally going back to the future. So th we have to watch this very, very carefully as we try to push tobacco control forward, both in this country and worldwide. <clears throat> Okay, great. And obviously, you know, when you get into the, the question of regulation, you need, you need ideas, you need some framework to model it around. And I'd like to turn that back to you, Ken. Now, can you give us some ideas of, you know, what policymakers should be, be considering in terms of uh, regulatory approaches for e-cigarettes? Uh, sure. I'd, I'd like to start by saying that I think uh, Dave hit the proverbial nail on the head when he said that we have to have the extent of regulations be proportional to the harm of the product. Uh, Howard mentioned earlier on that uh, currently the FDA has authority to regulate cigarette smokeless tobacco and, and loose tobacco, but not the novel products. Uh, the fact is FDA has done not much of anything with regard to the regulation of the products it's had the authority to regulate since the beginning of the, the law. So the deeming regulations, I think, are very important to give them the opportunity to regulate these alternative products. Um, I think the Regulatory barriers, just the bureaucracy, the uh, obviously the political opposition, the industry, the lawsuits are going to make any regulation difficult. Having said that, uh, this is what I would like to see in the form of what I get. I, I like to refer to as enlightened regulation. Uh, we need regulation that will focus on minimizing the risks at the same time that it increases, maximizes uh, the benefits. The problem here, and this is something nobody seems to be willing to talk about is anything that's going to be made attractive to adults to help them to quit smoking, hopefully, is going to attract some kids. So there's going to be this externality, if you will, this negative side effect of making the product attractive for adults. But we need to do that if it's going to have any benefit to them. The reason that uh, nicotine replacement therapy products are not terribly attractive to kids, aren't used by kids, is that they're not attractive to adults. They're not helping a large. They're not helping a large number of them at this stage. That's just a fact. So, what would I like to see? I'd like to see us prohibit the emission of dangerous substances, clearly dangerous substances. Use the cleaner forms of vaping, and there are some of those. Um, I very much agree on the idea of restricting marketing. I, Eric Lindblom recently proposed a restriction of marketing in the form of direct-to-consumer marketing to adult smokers. That's an interesting idea that needs some attention. Get rid of the lifestyle advertising. Vish mentioned the advertising is focused uh, very much on groups other than those it should be targeting. I've asked e-cigarette companies, where are the ads that are targeting the 50 and 60 year old smokers? I don't see those. I see them targeting 20 and 30 year olds and hence kids. And those people aren't trying to stop smoking. The people who are trying to stop smoking are the 50 and 60 year olds. Uh, that's where they should be focused. Um, prohibit sales to minors, of course. I believe personally that vaping should not be permitted where smoking is not permitted, and I don't really care whether the health consequences are severe or not. I think the non-smokers' rights should predominate over the smokers or the vapors. And because kids are more price sensitive than adults, I would like to see tax imposed on e-cigarettes and other vaping products, but it should only be done if the tax on cigarettes and other combustible tobacco products is much, much higher. We want to tax, the, we want to make the price, take it out of the realm of where kids are going to be attracted to it, and but put it into a perspective that adults are going to find, adult smokers are going to find these alternative products, relatively speaking, more attractive. And then finally, uh, and this gets to something we haven't talked about yet, uh, I hope that eventually FDA will move toward a policy that reduces, requires reduction of nicotine in combusted tobacco products to levels that would not sustain addiction. Uh, ironically, were this policy adopted, it would give smokers something that the industry has claimed all along that they want, and that's to smoke for pleasure rather than a physiological compulsion to do so. Uh, that policy would be aided 
if there were a number of good alternative nicotine delivery systems available for smokers to move to. Great. Uh, interesting set of policy recommendations. Vish, I understand that you've written some of your own. Uh, could you walk us through some of the highlights? Sure. So the American Association for Cancer Research and the American Society for Clinical Oncology uh, work together to come out with a giant uh, position statement on e-cigarettes. And we, uh, the, t the task force, made a number of uh, recommendations, uh, both in terms of research as well as uh, policy. Uh, and I think uh, Ken, uh, m most of what uh, Ken said were also uh, reiterated in that uh, position statement, except the one on taxes. Um, uh, so uh, I think the, the conclusion and the premise is that much of what we want to know about e-cigarettes and much of what we want to do about e-cigarettes can be done under a much tighter regulatory environment than the loose knit environment that we have today. So as if we can, if FDA can take charge and start regulation, then we can pursue research in a more systematic way. And a couple of things about that. One, I will just highlight a couple of them. One is there are about you know, 5,000 different flavors of e-cigarettes and almost 500 different brands. So there is no standardized uh, e-cigarette product. So we really don't know what people are vaping, right? So that provides a challenge to us to understand the physiological impact of e-cigarettes on, on people's health. So one is, I think, you know, people should be able to report, or companies should be forced to report the ingredients in these e-cigarettes so that we know what is actually being done or being Im or vaped or imbibed by people. Second, I think, you know, others have said it on this panel, restricting marketing is extremely important and critical. This is much more important than it was in 1940s and 50s precisely because our information environment is much more different today. We have a variety of different channels, and each, you know, with the internet, with social media, with webs, website, with blogs, uh, that we are able to really customize and target these messages for different audiences. So I think that makes it much more dangerous and potent, and it, it makes it that much more urgent to take control of the marketing and advertising environment uh, so that we can minimize the harm. Okay, great. Um, so obviously, you know, product with a potential for harm, perhaps some, some potential for, for some public health benefit in, in certain circumstances. Vaughn, talk a little bit about what you see as being the, being the potentials here. Um, well, I think Howard got it exactly right. What's at stake here is, is absolutely enormous in, in public health terms. For, for, um, almost half a million Americans per year and potentially this, this century, one billion deaths globally. Um, it's a problem that we need to get right. We need to bring the science to bear to make good decisions now to protect the public health from, from, this, from the tobacco epidemic. And e-cigarettes may be a, a, an invaluable tool in helping us to accomplish that if regulated correctly. So some of the issues, Ken, uh, Ken laid out some important fa uh, factors, you know, restricting sales to minors, uh, restricting, placing restrictions around advertising. Um, and particularly the, the question around price is an important one. We need to and we can clean e-cigarettes up. We're starting to get a better understanding about the constituents that are in e-cigarettes that are preventable or avoidable. And uh, we can find ways to deliver nicotine to consumers more cleanly than what we're currently doing. Toxic heavy metals, um, volatile organic compounds, fine particles um, can all be eliminated through the development of better technology. In line with that, um, we're thinking about developing better product standards, but having better regulation over the way the product is, is both designed and, and manufactured in order to perform in specific ways to reduce the harm to the consumer while promoting effective clean nicotine delivery. Um, one of the things that we're very interested in is the potential for e-cigarettes to promote nicotine dependence. We know that conventional tobacco <coughs> cigarettes are very good at um, promoting tobacco dependence. Um, it's very difficult for a conventional tobacco smoker to switch to an e-cigarette if they're not delivering adequate amounts of nicotine. In other words, e-cigarettes need to deliver comparable amounts of nicotine in a similar way as a conventional product in order for them to be a viable alternative to a conventional tobacco cigarette. What, so, uh, if, I, if I may interrupt you briefly, because there's some tension between what you're sketching out and what, what Ken talked about, where it seems like we're, are we talking about a need to have enough but not 
too much nicotine? Is that the, we the need goal? To make, we need to deliver enough nicotine in a way that's satisfactory to a smoker to make it a viable alternative. To discourage uh, conventional smokers from using both products over an extended period of time, if we're going to see harm reduction benefits, smokers need to switch completely from tobacco cigarettes to an e-cigarette. Okay. Um, and that can be accomplished through better technology and better um, <coughs> development of regulatory um, product standards. At the same time, e-cigarette regulation needs to be considered in the context of current tobacco um, regulations. And there are strategies um, in front of the FDA now potentially to reduce uh, nicotine delivery in conventional cigarette products. So just as we can set up a gradient in price, making um, the, um, an e-cigarette more favorable to, uh, to consumers compared with a conventional tobacco product, we might set up a gradient of, uh, of nicotine delivery, of pleasure, of satisfaction that favors e-cigarettes compared with conventional tobacco products by reducing nicotine delivery in conventional tobacco cigarettes and reducing those other additives and constituents which make products easy to use and appealing to consumers, particularly to youth. Um, and inherent in all of this argument is removing flavors that appeal to kids in e-cigarettes. It's an absolutely critical regulatory strategy that um, needs to be addressed by FDA. Okay. All, all points, obviously, as you say, that, that speak to regulation, that, that, that speak to the, the FDA. And we'd like to bring it back to you. David, tell us a little bit about some areas where uh, you know, you'd like to see the FDA act. Well, I think that you've heard the others mention them, which is the first priority is probably to try and um, position these products not as youth starter products. And you heard Ken and others talk about how advertising and marketing restrictions are critical restrictions on flavors and access. So, um, you know, there are more and more jurisdictions, both nationally and at the sub-national level, that are starting to implement, um, you know, sales ban to minors. So I think those are all important starting points. And those, you know, even for proponents, for proponents of these products who see a big public health impact, I think the best thing you can do for the product is actually to try and sever that tie with youth as much as possible. Uh, so I think that's an area where there's probably consensus on both sides of the aisle uh, and probably some move for immediate um, action in terms of the FDA. Uh, you know, the issue about what is the optimal level of nicotine delivery for these products, that's much trickier. Um, as I said before, the very features that make them appealing as a product to switch from cigarettes or to use as a quid aid are potentially the same characteristics that make them more appealing to use uh, as, a, as an uptake product. So, you know, we see very high levels of trying. In, in Canada, it's actually similar to the U.S. where it's about, uh, you know, a fifth of all of our youth and young adults are trying e-cigarettes. Very, very few of those are actually going on to use those products for any sustained period. But that's not a fixed, that's not a fixed entity. That could very much change as these products evolve. So, um, fortunately in the U.S., you have among the best scientists in the world and the resources to monitor the product very carefully uh, and I think that'll be very important for the FDA to facilitate moving forward. Okay, great. Well, I think so far we've had some, some really great ideas and, and some valuable insights. And at this point, we'd like to turn it off, turn this over to the, to the audience uh, to hear some of your thoughts. We'll, we'll get to you folks in the room, but we're going to start with the people online. Thanks, Scott. And uh, I do just want to say we have a very active chat going on right now. A lot of questions coming in. But I want to take one that's come in from Reuters with some breaking news. Just a few minutes ago, the CDC posted surprising new data on e-cigarette and tobacco use among U.S. teens. Electronic cigarette use among U.S. middle and high school students tripled in 2014, while smoking of conventional cigarettes fell by nearly 25%. How does this new information change the regulatory equation? Is this cause for alarm that youngsters are taking up the new devices so rapidly? or a new sign that e-cigarette use can reduce tobacco consumption. So that just came in, in interesting and relevant to our discussion. Well, I, I would start by saying that's not surprising news. We, we know the rates are going up dramatically among young people, and so this just confirms that trend. So it's accelerating. Uh, there was also a very important report from Monitoring the Future last year saying that among high school students, more high school students are now trying e-cigarettes in the last <coughs> month as opposed to traditional cigarettes. So this just underscores the urgency of getting our arms around this problem, getting the regulation process going both federally and also accelerating at the state and local level, and then doing that in a 
informed manner with the best research. So if this can be used as a form of harm reduction, we can get there sooner rather than later and put that all within the context of this very important global conversation on how do we accelerate tobacco control. Scott, can, can I chime in? Yeah, go ahead, Ken. Yeah, I, Howard started out saying exactly what uh, I was thinking. This isn't surprising because the data from the monitoring the future have indeed shown us the same thing. The new data demonstrates something absolutely fascinating. Uh, the decrease in smoking among the kids surveyed in 2014 when we saw this huge jump in e-cigarettes was the largest within memory. Uh, if you look at the fact, we've been seeing declining smoking among kids year after year for a long number of years now. Last year was the biggest one we've perhaps ever seen in terms of percentage points. I don't know what that means, but the questioner has uh, something we need to ask ourselves. Is there some sort of substitution going on? Are people who would have been smokers or were smoking, are they kids? Are they substituting e-cigarettes for that? And then Dave's point is really a critical one as well. Is this something of a fad or is this going to become a long-term sustained trend? So there is many questions raised by these data as there are answers, and we don't know whether this is a good, bad, or indifferent thing at this stage. Vaughn, I'd like to get your input on this, because one of the things that, that strikes me with this, this new data is that, you know, while I, you know, you've almost all, maybe all of you spoken about, you know, the, the desire to keep this product out of the hands of kids. On the other hand, we also know that really throughout their lives, well, throughout the population, teens do partake in some risky behaviors that, that maybe we'd rather not see them do, but if they're going to do them, we want to see them do it in a safer way. Um, is, there a, is there a harm reduction lesson here or a, a framework to, to be thinking about this? In? Well, we, we have to think in, ter in terms of harm reduction about what we're reducing harm from. And, uh, and with teens, the, the objective is to prevent initiation in the first place. So, uh, so the harm reduction debate <coughs> is not so relevant as, it is, as is the question of preventing youth initiation. And, uh, and the, the later we can, uh, or the, the longer we can prevent youth initiation, the later the age of initiation, the less likely uh, youth will, be, will, will mature to become dependent users of tobacco products. So, uh, I think that's an important strategy. Um, there's, there's clearly good news and bad news in the CDC data, and I think we want to uh, think very carefully about how we can um, continue to undermine or prevent youth um, access or interest in e-cigarettes um, because we're concerned about the potential for that to develop into other forms of tobacco use. Vish, you? Yeah, you know, this also, I think these data, as both Ken and Howard said, uh, reinforce what mo the monitoring the future uh, study has shown clearly. You know, the youth are not picking, out of the, picking up this habit out of thin air, right? You know, so we just saw very glamorous advertising trying to communicate a certain kind of aspirational messages, you know, uh, to the youth. I think the question to ask here is, you know, so what kind of information are they getting about e-cigarettes? And, and to what extent is this larger information environment influencing them uh, to pick up this habit vis-a-vis -vis other kinds of habits, I think. So this, this actually reinforces you know, the importance of placing some restrictions on advertising and marketing towards the youth. I think. Yeah, so. Great. Did we have another question from the online yes, audience? Yes, we do. We have a lot of them. Um, I'm going to try to pick ones that are representative of others. Um, Mr. Kenneth Warner mentioned that there are toxic substances in some e-cigs, not in others, besides the known nicotine. What might some of those be? Can you expound on this? I'm, I'm probably not the right person to try to give you a list of them uh, because I'm, I'm not a biological or chem chemical scientist. Uh, and I, I hope, I, I may have said that there are other, that some of the e-cigarette products aren't as dangerous. That's what I hope I said, that they're not as dangerous as others because they're not emitting some of these heavy metals and the like. Uh, I hope I didn't say that any of them were giving off only nicotine because I don't think we know that. Uh, Vaughn may have better knowledge of this than I do, but there's a huge array of substances that come out of different vaping products. Um, that's right, and I, and I think you know this underscores the need for re regulation to s s engage in surveillance of um, e-cigarette products, so that we do know what's in them. And with um, effective product standards, um, manufacturers will be required to ensure that products are kept um, 
keep um, harmful constituents at an absolute minimum and report that to a, to a regulatory authority such as FDA. Great. Great. Uh, I think I'll take one more and then we'll see if anyone here has questions. I'm sure you do. Uh, we are getting a lot of questions from Canada. I just want everyone to know. <laughs> In the past, tobacco users denoted the use of tobacco on insurance policy applications. More recently, it has shown that those who use e-cigarettes are denoting that no, they do not use tobacco but through health exams it is revealed that nicotine is present in their systems. How will the insurance industry need to change theories of thinking when it comes to this product? Maybe I can start. I mean, there, there are debates <laughs> about exactly what do we term these products, and you probably know that uh, several years ago the FDA tried to regulate e-cigarettes as delivery devices, and that was struck down in court. And actually, a judge ruled that this could be now potentially regulated uh, as a tobacco product. So that's what gave uh, FDA the motivation to move forward with this proposed deeming rule. So this is now accepted as a tobacco product by definition, although some might debate that, including the insurance plans that you just cited. Uh, I, th I think the more we call this a tobacco product, treat it like a tobacco product, uh, make that uniform throughout all our discussions, whether it's with health insurance or other uh, themes, uh, the more we can make progress in this whole area. Thank you. Great. Did we want to take one from the room? One perspective that hasn't uh, been mentioned yet um, is, um, which, which I'll uh, articulate in just a second, um, gets his motivation from looking um, steadily at the facts that both Howard and Vaughn mentioned, that a, a billion people may die in this century from tobacco, and that elimination of tobacco is the single most powerful uh, intervention that uh, is, is feasible for improving population health, uh, something that d the public doesn't think about steadily. Now, uh, given that, this is what motivates the idea of the tobacco end game, of, of severing tobacco from the human race once and for all, and getting rid of this greatest of threats. If, if the, if the, uh, the e-cigarette um, uh, word, uh, word, wording there were replaced by Ebola, uh, people would think, Why, of course you should regulate, well, whatever, look, Ebola is a terrible threat to us. They have no idea that tobacco is vastly more threatening to the human race than Ebola is. Now, in one of those ads, the, the word that really got my attention was, not, and there's no stigma. But achieving a stigma for the use of tobacco has been one of the fantastic victories of the anti-tobacco movement. And the, the, the picture we're given here is of these glamorous youth smoking in public without any sense of stigma at all, which would mean giving up one of the great achievements that's been uh, uh, hard fought for and won in the United States. 10 steps back, even if e-cigarettes are not all that dangerous, still, it takes away the stigma of smoking. So I'm, this, this idea of a tobacco endgame is not one that we're, where the public health community is thinking about the same goals as the public, and certainly not the e-cigarette industry. And so it's hard to debate, put this into the debate, because they just reject the premise. What do you think? Oh. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll start. I mean, there are many, there are many questions uh, and themes in there, and so let, let me just start by saying, you know, Vicious point that the tobacco industry has basically renormalized smoking through pushing the e-cigarette product is, is very, very disturbing for public health from a broad perspective. Uh, on the other hand, we we are now talking about a potential end game. Last year was the 50th anniversary of the Landmark Surgeon Journal's report on tobacco from 1964. Uh, it was, there was a, a summit at the White House. I had the great honor of being there in my role as Assistant Secretary for Health. And leaders like Ken Warner and others were there talking about, can we, can we see a time sooner rather than later where we can stop sales of tobacco in certain places, where we can see tobacco products in this country uh, put forward with nicotine levels that are less than addictive. And th these are points that Ken just raised. Shortly after that, we saw CVS announce that they were going to stop selling tobacco throughout all their stores in the United States, and they've renamed their organization CVS Health. So that, that was part of an end game strategy, if you will. 
So um, it's very, very important to keep this conversation going, uh, and we don't need the renormalization of tobacco in the midst of this to, to get us to the goal of ending this epidemic, and that's where we all need to, to go in this country and worldwide. You know, I, I want to put this in a larger context, too. If you look at it, in the 20th century, 100 million people died of tobacco-related deaths, right? That's in a one-third of the U.S. population today. Uh, six million people die of tobacco-related uh, users uh, globally. 80% of these deaths come from low- and middle-income countries, I think. So we don't have to, we should not just limit our conversation only to the U.S., I think this, these renormalization efforts, these efforts to create a sense of glamour, association with adventure, independence, actually have an impact beyond the United States, you know, because of the dominance of American cultural industry globally, I think. So we, if once when we talk about you know, restricting marketing, restricting advertising, the beneficiaries are not just the youth in the United States, you know, but also, I think, you know, in other countries who are continuously exposed to these kinds of messages, I think. So it's very critical for us to think about this process of renormalization while protecting if there are, if the question is if, if there are any public health benefits in e-cigarettes, we can continue to do that. We can continue with that process under a tightly regulated environment without the necessity of this kind of marketing, I think. Yes. Great. Can I jump in on that as well? I would just add that, you know, one of the things that these products are doing is forcing us to be a bit more nuanced in terms of when we talk about tobacco. Um, I mean, it's, it's the mode of delivery. It's ingesting tobacco through smoke that is responsible for most of the harm. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's forcing us to, to think about denormalization of smoking versus denormalization of other forms of nicotine intake. So we don't denormalize the use of uh, the patch or the gum in other words, nicotine in intake through the mouth or the skin the same way that we do through smoke. Um, and so I think the goal needs to remain very much squarely focused on denormalization of smoking. And to the extent that, um, that we want to think about how e-cigarettes and vaporized nicotine is positioned, well, I think that comes back to what we've been talking about in terms of restrictions on marketing and labeling. So we've done some work on that and, and it's marketing advertising bans, it's labeling of the products themselves that very much shapes denorm along with mass media campaigns. And so there's a possibility to sort of shape denorm of smoking and vaporized nicotine products in a deliberate way. And I think the debate is gonna be about what we wanna do and how we shape those products relative to each other. Can I, can I chime in? I'd, I'd like to reinforce uh, what both Dave and, and Howard and others are saying here. Uh, I do think I do think the two critical regulatory elements here are marketing and public place use. If we want to talk about denormalization, I also think in regard to the speaker's question, what has made this issue so difficult is the differentiation between smoked or combusted tobacco products and other tobacco products. I. Uh, Howard mentioned it's it's just been a little over a year since the release of the 50th anniversary Surgeon General's report. We seem to have forgotten one of the principal messages that came out of that report, which is that the enemy here is combusted tobacco, and we need to focus laser light on combusted tobacco. Um, that's not to say that oral tobacco use in some parts of the world, like India and the Sudan, is not a very serious problem. But in some countries like Sweden, it may have been part of the solution of the tobacco disease problem. So snus, which is a form of smokeless tobacco that's been used for four decades or more by males in Sweden, has led to the finding that the Swedes use tobacco at about the same levels as other European countries, but they don't smoke much. They use snus. And if you look at their rates of death from lung cancer, tobacco-related heart disease, overall mortality associated with tobacco, they are dramatically lower than the second best country in each of those categories in all of the European Union. So this is a complicated issue because it's not a matter of, I mean, if we could wave our hands and say, let's get rid of all tobacco, I think everybody in public health want, would want to do that. Tobacco has been with us for two millennia and it's not about to go away overnight. And uh, we just need to keep that in mind. One more thing, I just say this very quickly because I think this is important for people to recognize. 
a colleague, David Mendez, and I have uh, a model, simulation model, by which we've been projecting smoking prevalence in the United States since the mid-1990s. The model has been extremely accurate through uh, the year 2010, the last time we checked. Uh, if we don't do anything different from what we're doing today, it is plausible that we will have smoking prevalence above 10% in the United States in the year 2050. That's a frightening prospect. That's why we've got to start thinking about these end game notions and the subtleties of smoked versus non-smoked and so on. Dramatic projections. Do we have? Thanks, I don't think we have time, but there are a lot of questions online. I encourage everyone to go on because I know we want to hear your closing comments. Okay, so uh, just to, to wrap it up, I'd like each of you to make just one brief and, and, and try to keep it brief because we are tight on time here, policy recommendation. Start with you, Vaughn, and work your way down the line. Sure, thank you. Well, I, I think we can all see that we have an amazing opportunity here, but we need to protect the public health gains that we've, that we've gained over the past um, half century. Um, it seems that there might be a sweet spot in terms of regulation. We need to continue to dis discourage youth from adopting e-cigarettes. We need to maintain denormalization of use of tobacco products. We can accomplish that through effective marketing strategies, um, imposition of tax policy. Um, we also need to impose product standards which help to make e-cigarettes a more viable alternative and a safer alternative to uh, as safe as they can be and, and a better alternative to, than uh, combustible tobacco cigarettes. Well, my final message for everyone watching is keep the discussion on tobacco control alive. This is still an ever-present, overwhelming public health threat for all of us in this country and worldwide. This e-cigarette conversation can be very healthy if it keeps us exploring how best to get to the end game and, and, the, and the epidemic. Dish. I agree. I think, you know, I don't, you know, people on this side of the table, on the other side of the table, as well as those who are on the TV, I don't want us to sit 30 years from now again and meet and say, we made a mistake, you know, we did not know what we were doing. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, that's exactly what happened, you know, in the, in the, with the cigarette, uh, with the tobacco problem earlier. So I think it's extremely important, extremely urgent to really eliminate this problem of tobacco, you know, globally, because it's just not for the U.S., you know, there are serious, significant public health implications all over the globe. Great. Yes. Ken. I don't think I need to add anything to the uh, very astute comments of my colleagues here. I agree with them. David, last word goes to you if you want it. I would just suggest that we need to think about the range of tobacco and nicotine products collectively together, and we need to regulate them with an eye on what regulation to one set of products, what the implications might be for the other set of products. And I would just hang on because it's going to be a, a crazy ride in terms of regulatory experimentation <laughs> and um, with very high stakes for public health. Well, uh, this crazy ride, I'm afraid, has come to an end. <laughs> However, uh, online, I do encourage you to keep the conversation going on Twitter and, and on the forum. Um, and also, I want you to think about uh, tuning in for our next event. This is going to be May 15th, a Friday, and it's going to focus on how new technologies are transforming healthcare here at the forum. Um, with that, thank you all for your time. It's been a pleasure.